This is KPFK Los Angeles, 90.7 FM. My name is Jay Green, and I'll be your host for the next two hours. I usually start the show off with a composition uh, by Thelonious Monk, Straight No Chaser, which is the title of this program. Uh, But since my guest tonight hasn't recorded this, but recorded another equally brilliant composition of Monk's around midnight, I decided to part with tradition, so to speak. The album we've been listening to is by Sun Ra and his orchestra on Hat Hut Records. Uh, The album's title is Sunrise in Different Dimensions. We'll be listening to another cut from this album a little later in the show, so I'll run down the personnel then. Sun Ra, as he has put it, is known by many names. Mr. Mystery, Cosmo Musical Scientist, a spirit of jazz who, as he has stated, is preparing us for the voice from another planet. He can truly put you in the cosmos, musically as well as verbally, as you shall soon hear. He also prepares his orchestra members in musical enlightenment, some of whom leave the orchestra and form their own groups, but he always seems to replace them with equally talented people. Sun Ra was just telling me that Wynton Marcellus had inquired about the possibility of joining the orchestra. I think Wynton, as all of us, could use some of the cosmos. We'll get to that a little later. First, uh, since we just played a composition by Thelonious Monk, let's talk a little about that. Uh, Thelonious was surely uh, an individualist and was, uh, like yourself, uh, outside of any mainstream direction. Uh, Would you consider Thelonious Monk a great creator? Well, I consider him a limited creator. He didn't want to do... Some things he wanted to do, he couldn't do. Like uh, I heard the the, the last part of his life, he was saying, there was someone, please send me a drama. None of the dramas could satisfy him. Mm -hmm. I heard Mm -hmm. that so then well it was limited because he couldn't do what he wanted to do but so was Duke Elton Mm -hmm. do you feel you can do what you want to do? yeah I I can on the earth plane up under um, a different sort of uh, control you might say Mm -hmm. because I really like to play the low profile but then it it, it, uh, because I'm a scholar you see and scholars like that but of course, it's not my destiny to play the low profile. And I have to present what I have to to the world. Mm-hmm. Which you do very well. Um, I want to go back a little bit. I mentioned to you, I, I'd, I'd like to play one cut uh, from Fletcher Henderson's orchestra. And you were in Chicago, I guess, in the late 1940s, and you joined Fletcher Henderson. Is that... Yes. How, how did that come about? Well, you know, um, I was writing the show anyway you see so when the pianist he had Marl Young uh, he was a lawyer he's in the San Fr- I mean he's here now here uh, a lawyer and uh, he he uh, was in the car asleep because he was playing at night and going to law school in the daytime they said and he missed the show so they sent for me and uh, Fletcher kept me mm-hmm. he, liked, he liked the way I was playing what uh, you I know, I know you have a great amount of respect for Fletcher Henderson. What uh, what made Fletcher such a great musical leader, and and what did you learn from him while you were in the orchestra there? Well, I was listening to him when I was a baby in the cradle. I, I didn't know it was Fletcher Henderson, but my people always had the records on like Bessie Smith, Clara Smith, Mamie Smith, all the great blacks that I found out later. That's what they were playing all the time. So then when I I went to high school, I, I got acquainted with Fletcher Henson again and other jazz greats. Uh, but um, I like bands, and Fletcher had a, a very precision-like band, uh-huh. and I like that. With, with, with a lot of feeling. With a lot of feeling. And then he had, he said, had a lot of sympathy for people, too. He was unselfish, and uh, he made a, a lot of great musicians. All of them came to his band. The greatest ones. Louis mm. Armstrong had to come for that band. Coleman Hawkins. And Coleman Hawkins and um, Henry Red Allen. I mean, really great uh, masters. Mm-hmm. Fats Waller, too, played in that band. So then I was, um, or whatever, with someone I really admired. Uh-huh. And, 
And so you think that in, ter- in terms, let's say, of discipline of a band, do you think that you learned something while you were in the band about that? Because I know in your band you have a tremendous amount of discipline in the band, and uh, it's a very it's a it's an orchestra that's very uh, has has a lot of spirit. Did you did you get any of that from uh, while you were with Fletcher Henderson? Well, yes, but I uh, always. Uh, as a child, I always listened to teachers and instructors, you see. I wasn't a rebel when it comes to uh, learning something from somebody. So it was ingrained in me to listen anyway and mm-hmm. to follow directions. Mm-hmm. So it was good. already there before you ever got into the orchestra. Oh, yeah, it had to be. Because like Fletcher would always call about, he directed, you see, <clears throat> except two numbers, uh, Stealing Apples and Human Rest. Sometimes he'd play that, not every night some and uh, he'd always call about four, three or four numbers, and you had to get those out, you see, because he'd run straight on through it. And if the first man didn't, if first trumpet man didn't have his part, he kicked it off anyway. That's one thing you had to have your music, because when he, he had a certain time limit, and he'd kick it off. Okay, who didn't have that music? So one night, <clears throat> see, I always put the music up there, even on the numbers I didn't play. When he called them, I'd put it up there. It's fortunate too, because one night. He kicked off stealing apples, and he wasn't at the piano. He just kicked it off, and the solo was written, so I played it just like him. Uh-huh. Good, good thing I could sight read. But he smiled. I think he was trying to, maybe he just forgot to come to the piano. I don't know, but I was ready, you see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's something I guess everybody in your band always has to be ready. Oh, they have to be ready, you know. Yeah. They have to be ready for me to call. I call one song, and I start off playing another one. If, a little too too long or I maybe the mood I feel is better for people they need that right then so I changed because mm-hmm. I I'm in um, sort of psychic contact with people and I, I play what they need rather mm-hmm. than sometimes what they want I play what they need because this planet really needs a lot of things it's uh, practically terrifying to, to think you've got something to offer to five billion people but that's where it has to be because you see they do have something. That's something that uh, is facing people who have five billion people to get it, and that's nuclear warfare. So then, the way the the forces are, it has to offer something else better for them. But they have to choose. This is a matter of choosing. Judgment day means the people on this planet got to judge what is better for them, what they need, rather than what they want, so they can survive. It's mm-hmm. judgment day, all right. But it's not that God's going to judge people. People have to, they got two choices only. No more fence sitting. They can have nuclear warfare or they can have what I'm talking about. But I'm not a minister, you see, and I don't have a cult. I'm not a politician. That makes it kind of difficult because people got classifications for certain people they listen to. But I'm just, um, you might say I'm an ambassador to this planet. Mm-hmm. I won't say from whom because in Seattle I said from whom and they they, they, they edited that out. <laughs> but it was the answer. That's why they, it was too much for them. Yeah. It was too much for them. Too much for me. But actually I know that is the only solution for this planet to have an ambassador from someone who can stop all this. Uh-huh. Because actually uh, you do have a governmental force that, uh, that are all people are part of. They're citizens of <clears throat> what I choose to call the omniverse. I'm not dealing with the universe anymore. I've been promoted. I'm dealing with the omniverse. And uh, did we? I introduced the space age. Now I'm introducing the omni age because all around you, you'll see a uh, company's name Omni. Every, in every city, Omni's out there right before everybody. Of course, they're not noticing it, but they should look and see. Atlanta got a, we got a term called Omni. In Holland, uh, they got, um, well, I was talking about the omniverse, it's not in the dictionary yet, but Holland uh, has stole my, stole the word, and they got a theater called Omniverse. And it's, you don't have one like it in America, you have to lay down and look at the film because it's all around you. It's up in the ceiling, it's all around. Fantastic theater in The Hague. Hmm. So, Europe, I play in Europe, I play in every country in Europe, and they're listening, it's front page news, you know. In every country. In fact, in in Portugal, uh, Spain won. They had Reverend Sunra. I don't know how they got that. They had what? Reverend Sunra. Reverend Sunra. That's right. It's in Italy, they be sending a divine Sunra. I don't tell them to say that. You see, in New York, they got some buttons out called Sunra, King of the Omniverse. 
I'd like to have one of those buttons. <laughs> I have to look for that next it's time really, I go to New York. It, it, uh, sweet basil. Yeah. Not, yeah. Oh yeah, you play sweet basil, mm-hmm. right? You yeah. just played there. Well, well, let's listen to a cut from uh, Fletcher Henderson's orchestra. Uh, this we're gonna we're, we're gonna hear something called King Porter Stomp, and it was recorded back in March of 1928. We started this set off with uh, a masterpiece, as uh, my guest this evening, Sun Ra, described it. King Porter Stomp. Uh, we started off with Fletcher Henderson and his orchestra, recorded in March of 1928, and from there uh, we went to. Uh, the updated version, as so to speak, by the orchestra from the album Sunrise in Different Dimensions. Again, we heard Jelly Roll Morton's composition, King Porter Stomp, from the uh, Sun Ra Orchestra. Sun Ra on piano and organ, John Gilmore on tenor saxophone, clarinet, and flute, Marshall Allen on alto saxophone, oboe, and flute, Michael Ray on trumpet and flugelhorn, Noel Scott on alto and baritone saxophones and flute, Danny Thompson on baritone saxophone and flute, Kenneth Williams on tenor and baritone saxophone and flute, Chris Henderson on the drums, Eric Walker joining uh, Chris Henderson, Sun Ra and the orchestra. In this band that you were in with Fletcher Henderson, do you remember any particular outstanding soloists that were uh, that were in that band in the 1940s? And did they record it all? I don't remember. Uh, he didn't some... record. Fletcher was playing... Uh, the low profile uh-huh. <clears throat> because a lot of musicians get in his band and it goes somewhere he lose and so he just he just got a band that was already organized from from, from uh, Pittsburgh they said all of them were good musicians um, but he, and they they really played they yeah. could sight read he had to play off somebody who could sight read because the show changed every every month uh-huh. You had to be able to sight read. Yeah, that's where I got in the in the band. In the sense I could sight read all those arrangements, because he didn't do a lot of rehearsal. You, know? mm-hmm. you do, you do do a lot of rehearsing, don't you? Yeah, because I'm I'm busy developing out on farms, which he couldn't because of the society and other things. People wanted to say things, and and he had to, to bow to that. Uh-huh. Some musicians didn't like what he did, doing a lot of standards, a lot of pop songs. I heard that they had trouble about that. And even Coleman Hawkins said you should have kept on playing the stomps. Uh-huh. Yeah. They should have, you shouldn't have changed the style. And the stomps are some of the greatest things, all right. But the Pletcher uh, stretched out and was playing other things. But he yeah. had trouble. Like, he was playing the Burlesque Theater in Chicago. And musicians would come up uh, a half hour late and all that. He had a big band. He'd have to start with five and six pieces. They didn't like that. They liked to play in the other things. Uh huh. You still do Fletcher Henderson's uh, some of his arrangements, don't you? Or? Oh yeah. Basically, basically speaking, I feel that the world would be a better place if they recognized people who came before us who did beautiful things, and it would be a better world if they did recognize the ones who did something beautiful despite conditions on this planet. In fact, they have to. They have to use uh, uh, things from people who were beautiful. Because mm-hmm. there's not much beauty in the world today. It's not much possible from teenagers because they're living in an age that uh, is very discouraging and they have a high suicide rate because uh, there's no one to show them what to do. Yeah, the Parents can't because the parents didn't live, live in that kind of, this kind of age, you see. They can't tell them what to do. The... Uh yeah, sometimes I wonder if there's any hope for man. Is is man's failures become kind of irreversible? Do you think now, or do you think we still are going to be able to turn things around? Well, the possibility that listen to me, the whole planet can change. But you see, a man is doomed, and woman too. So I'm dealing with things equation. I say you have to get rid of the word man and the word woman, and instead of getting rid of the person. Mm-hmm. But that's over the equation of fantasy. But I'm saying you got to change the name of this planet too, because it's got to go. Earth got to go, and man got to go, and woman got to go. So they should get rid of the word mm-hmm. instead of the person. But they have to realize they're dealing with uh, psychic things, and the psychic equation has been thrown on man on this planet. And when they solve it, they will have risen up above being man and woman. The next uh, step is being an angel. They're probably angels anyway who fell. Uh, some people are saying they're angels, you know, yeah. but they fall in angels, you know. So I'm dealing with that too about the angel. I say I'm an angel, you know. 
I'm a bad, but you know, it's better <laughs> to be a bad angel than to be a good man, mm-hmm. a good woman. Is this is this going to lead us from the space age to the omniverse? Is this how this is going to transpire? The omniverse going to multiplicity of things. Of course, uh, people can't stay the way they are because they've done the best they can, you see, and it's not working. So they got to have something better. They can, they can get a better world when they have something better than good. Right now they're dealing with the good book and things on a good plane. But it, 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 the day... It, the things today are the results of the good book. It's a source book for everything on this planet. Now they need a better book. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they're good, better, and best, you know. So they need something better. And a blueprint for something better is much better than the good book. Well, I'm representing something that's better for people, but then I'm not uh, dealing in righteousness or nothing. People like to have something to cling on to. They want to be righteous and all that, but they, they're just what they are. I can accept them what they are, you see, because that's what you have to work with. You can't convert them. It's like trying to convert a lion. You know, you can't do that. He's still a wild beast, no telling when he's going out. Well, then I said that man and woman, they're over there. They practically wild beasts now. So you have to, they have to be uh, raised up on a higher level. And then they do those things on a higher level. But as man and woman, they can't do anything but what man and woman has always done. That's being disobedient to high authorities. And like Adam and Eve, that's what they were, disobedience. And all these people are supposed to be descended from two disobedient people. Man, the first man the first woman disobedient. They died, and everybody been dying since. But I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about the people got this great potential to even be immortals, but they can't get it being righteous, you know. But they could get it through being obedient and through listening. They mm-hmm. have to listen now because that's the only way it's going to be done. If these scientists develop the ultimate indestructible weapons and uh, therefore you can get the ultimate in, in creative things, better creative things, I mean, you can, it's a two-way thing. It's just a matter of people who put all their energies to develop things destructive and they haven't put all their energies toward developing something mainly themselves to a higher plane. Mm-hmm. They have to do that now. They can't remain like this. They have to. This is it. Now they got to have a different kind of music. Definitely the music got to change. Some people are waking up to the danger of the music the teenagers have been playing, and uh, they just been out there doing that themselves. That's because some kind of way the masses in America weren't taken care of, and they, they let a lot of them die over in jazz and all that. They didn't help them. And then it was nothing left but the teenagers trying to seek something different, and they try to do it without masters. Of course, they have to turn there and follow masters. But then they probably already follow the masters of evil, but they have to follow other type of masters. It's not trying to destroy them. And uh, the way is uh, open for them. You know, nothing happens on this planet unless somebody opens the way. Unfortunately, grown people did not open the way for their children. They expect for them to be nice, and they weren't nice themselves. Like for, uh, in Germany, a woman, German woman told me that um, one day I was going to get all the teenagers in the world to follow me. I said, I don't ever be around them. As far as I'm concerned, they'll chip off the old blocks, and the old blocks ain't no good. So, But anyway, increasingly, more and more teenagers showing up when we play, increasingly, all over the world. And they're listening, and they're singing, about space. Well, that's a good sign. Space is the place. Let's listen to something from an album, a new album of Sunrise, uh, and speaking of space, where spaceships appear. Sun Ra and his orchestra uh, taking with us, taking us with them into outer space. You've been in space. Yes, I uh, Definitely been to planet Jupiter and the rest of the places I went. I don't know the names, but I knew I was on Jupiter. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm, I'm singing about the second stop of Jupiter and describing it in one of my songs. Mm-hmm. You've uh, you're from another planet, Sunra. Well, I'm from another uh, another dimension, like the omniverse. You might say it's just a little universe here. Uh huh. The omniverse is much larger. Oh, yes. All, all the universe is put together. So in this way, to play that kind of music, that means I have to play everything. 
all the emotions that human beings know, and I have to touch the parts of them they don't know that's part of them. That's my mission, to touch the parts of them that they don't know they have. The scientists know nothing about. And just by going to hear you live, that's what happens. I yeah, know it. Turn, turn them on. They turned off right now. Yeah. Got to turn them on. Yeah. I and can't wait. That, I can't wait. Turn off wait. that part of them to self-destruct. You see, they got a part to self-destruct. You don't have to kill them. You know, you don't need no, no uh, nuclear war. The people die anyway because they self-destruct. So then that part has to be turned off. And the other part where they have the seeds of immortality, you touch that part, and uh, that's it. It can be done. But, you know, it has. It can be done with colors and music. If you have the right colors and the right music and the right vibrations, they can get immortality now. Now I'm not talking about what I think. I'm talking about the reality of it. Up in Boston, uh, there's a fellow named Bill Sebastian, and he deals with lights, and, and he's got this light machine that he plays. It's a keyboard. makes no sound. makes light. And uh, it's taken him about 10 or 12 years to make this machine. He said he was inspired to make it by my music. Now, up at uh, Boston, up in uh, Boston at the university up there, they had a particular room where he's owned after engineers. And one night, he, he was playing a record that I called I, Pharaoh. I'm talking about in my talent. And then he, had, he was making a videotape of the lights and the music. He said all at once, he felt and touched in my tablet from that music the lights. It was just right. So when he when he played the, the video tape back, it was blank. He huh. said it happened to him. So at least one man can say that he felt in my tablet. They were surprising to me. But nevertheless, it, uh, it can happen at this point. See, everything that's possibly bad has happened to humanity. They've been through all this. I don't see how they, they've been able to stand all this. But... Um, they can get something else now because I desire them to have something better. You see, you haven't had anybody that want anything to happen good for people. They always want something bad to happen. And this is a plan of desire. According to desire, that's what you get. No one ever desired for all nations to share in something as great as immortality. No one desired that because all the nations are busy. They desire something for themselves only, and all races desire something for themselves only. And they don't desire things for everybody. But they have to, uh, in order to combat death that takes everybody, they got to have something that takes everybody, regardless of their race, regardless of their sex, and regardless of anything, good or bad, because that's the only way they're going to defeat death. They got to have something that would include everybody. And mm -hmm. death takes all nations. Now, you got to have something that will accept all nations regardless of anything. You got to have something so great that it can rescue the people who were kidnapped by death because they're not dead, you know, they're in captivity. Now, they have to, nothing good can happen for the, the ones supposed to be live walking around here until you get all them beautiful people over in that cemetery. Now, this is something very vast I'm talking about, but I have the thought to talk about it, and it's whether people can be intelligent enough to use their intuition and see that I've had, uh, that I do have the authority to do that. That's not saving people. That's doing something that's coordinating them. I'd say I'm a coordinator. Mm -hmm. They're not worth saving. You know, I wouldn't even use that word because the devil and God and Lucifer and everybody jump over there on saviors. So I would say I'm a coordinator to coordinate them and harmonize themselves where they can uh, be suitable to be a part of the greater omniverse. Mm -hmm. They citizens of the omniverse, you know, uh, but they they never have approached the emperor. Uh, they always talk about kings. I'm talking about the emperor of the empire of the omniverse. Of course, that hasn't been talked about in religion or anything else because they know nothing about the emperor of the empire. Well, Star Wars talked about the empire. It talked mm -hmm. about some things. It talked about forces and all that. And it's true, you know. Well, I'm talking about something that's totally fantastic, totally impossible. I'm talking about doing something for five billion people, and they never listen to their governments, not their preachers, not nobody. But I have to have something so profound until it's irresistible, more irresistible than death itself. Now, that puts me way out there, you see. That's when I play the low profile. Mm -hmm. I play low profile. If you weren't playing the low profile, let's say you were uh, president and you were living in the black house, 
Uh, what 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 would you do? I mean, what would your first uh, orders be to do to make the universe? Well, I, first, move I into am the, the president. P R E C E D E N T. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. I'm not going to argue with that, but I'm just thinking. What well, other kind of president? Yeah, the other kind of president. That's some people put up there, but this is something that someone else sent here for people to um, follow. There's only one thing that worries me. I am going to be successful. And um, I got a song about that, too. That five billion people listening to a truth they never heard before. These people are dreadful, you know. All these nations are most horrible. But they got these points about them that, that I can see that potential. The potential is wonderful. The, the history they got, I reject that. What they are, I reject that. I can't use that, you know. None of them are rights in my eyesight. None of them are really evil. they just trapped, you know. They're all in prison. Like I said, um, I'm a scientist, and I look at things from equation to point of view. And, like, they talking about South Africa, and these people got these passes. But everybody's in some kind of jail. What's the difference? In, and you got to have a passport to get out of America. You got to have a pass to get from one country to another. What's the difference in 3,000 miles and four blocks? There's no difference, you know. They all they all hemmed up in something that's not good for them. If it was good for them, these bad things wouldn't be happening. But I have to judge a tree by the fruit. And what I see, I will not accept it. Not even my human side. I won't accept anything like this as suitable for me to be part of this planet. I refuse. It's not about uh, people accepting me. It's about me accepting them, because what they got over there. I wouldn't even give the destiny that human beings got to a dog. Mm. I would not do it because they might think everything is all right, but they're in the illusion that everything is all right and everything been all right. But this has been going on thousands of years, and the fruits of it is unacceptable. I can't accept anything like that. Well, mainly because I know something better. Well, I got it in my music, but um, a lot of people uh, in this country it seemed that uh, I've been quite, it's been a blackout concerning me. But in Europe, everybody knows about TV, newspapers, big coverage. Here, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. It's strange. It, it's getting strange to me. Why? But there are some people that's late enough, like San Francisco, where we played in a small cultural house, and you could read the paper and see it. They were surprised at the multi ethnic. Uh, audience, you see, mm -hmm. the teenagers was there. Every it was just multi-ethnic. So that means that these people, um, there are some people who begin to feel that what I'm talking about, they should listen. Right, and you're you're telling them something important, like like nuclear war, which was uh, something you composed and came out with uh, on an album, and also have performed many times, I know. You know, it has a strange... In France, we were doing something for TV, and um, I played Shadow World. That's one of my ultra pieces, uh, Advent Super Happening. So I played that. The producer of the show said, we even rehearsed it again, he's going to cancel the show. It upset him so bad. So then that upset me. That made me sort of angry. And I, so I played, uh, I said... I played one of my Ultra Earth songs, which is Nuclear Wall. And because uh, I felt that he would accept uh, Shadow World before he would that, but then it's been on TV about four or five times, prime time in France. Nuclear, Nuclear Wall, War has? Which, which Philadelphia, uh, the station manager told Philadelphia Place they played it again, he's going to find him. And in New York said, well, they didn't know. And Columbia Record come. They said they'd have to give it to the marketing department to see what they could do, but they never answered because they uh, they were afraid. But with all this pornography going on, I'm telling the truth in that song. So I, I mean, from what I hear on radios and things, I mean, uh, in, in seeing newspapers, TV, it was it really I can't understand why they didn't want people to hear that song. I can't understand it either. I should mention that before. The uh, before we heard uh, Sun Ra and his orchestra live at Montreux, and we heard Travel the Spaceways, uh, Sun Ra, John Gilmore, Marshall Allen, Danny Davis, Pat Patrick, James Jackson, Elo Omo, Danny Thompson, 
Ahmed Abdullah, Chris Capers, Al Evans, Vincent Chauncey, Craig Harris, Stanley Morgan, Clifford Jargis, Larry Bright, Haynes Burnett, oh, the wonderful June Tyson, who will be who's still with Sun Ra. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then before that, we heard When Spaceships Appear. This is from an album that's a recent album. It's not on, it doesn't look like it's on El Saturn. Did you change it to Ra? Is that the... Uh, well, see, the, that, I'm dealing in a lot of symbols now. See, Saturn, right? Oh, oh, oh I see. <laughs> you just don't have... There. I got you. The picture's there instead of the words. Aura. Is that the title of the album? Aura. Uh, Aura that, Sun. That, that's the title I use uh, for records, too. You know? Yeah. See, it's up there, too. Uh, I got you. Album. I got you. And that's, that's a new release from Sun Ra. And again, uh, we ended things on this last set with uh, nuclear war and uh, what truer words could ever be spoken than if they push that button you can kiss your ass goodbye <laughs> and that's the truth and they don't want to face the truth Sun Ra. and well, you're yeah. telling them the truth but, but they yeah, just governments are talking about it now and they don't want to have uh, that's been ringing one over there and met this avid leader because it's dreadful you know? yeah yeah Let's let, let's get away from nuclear war for a few minutes, anyhow, if we can. And usually, when I'm thinking too much about um, uh, the presidents and the leaders of the nation, I try to stick your records on immediately. <laughs> and it it definitely takes me out into the cosmos, which is exactly where I want to be. Uh, and speaking of the cosmos and uh, uh, and um, Sun Ra and his orchestra. We're going to be listening to an album that he did in Egypt, and uh, I wanted to ask you about your stay in Egypt. I know you did a New Year's Eve concert in Egypt a couple of years ago, didn't you? You were yeah. there for a couple of months, and you you visited some pyramids, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, every day. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. I know Danny told me a story about how you went into a uh, pyramid and the lights went out. The first time I went there, uh, I went in a big pyramid, you know, Pyramid of Giza, and uh, I said, well, this pyramid was built to people who were saying the name Ra in it. So it hadn't been said in this in thousands of years, so let's say it nine times. And we said the name Ra nine times, and all the lights went out in the pyramid. We were up in the King's Chain at that point. It was so dark, it's indescribable. And uh, the, the guide with us had a, a little candle. It looked like a match. He lit it, and that's where we came down. Now, we had to walk down a ramp backwards, you know, because of, well, it's about 12 stories down or something like that if you, you fall. So we walked down very carefully backward. And then we went in the Queen's Chamber. The guy said, let's go in the Queen's Chamber. And then I said, well, some other time. But he was the guy and he had to count them. So he grabbed my hand and he said, now. So we had to go down and like, bend all the way down and go through like a tunnel to get to the Queen's Chamber. We came to the Queen's Chamber and the lights came on. Now, when I came back to New York, a man came up to the piano and, and put a book on them. The book, uh, it was something in the book that said, uh, the Queen's Chamber is a place of enlightenment. You see, a lot of strange things happen to me psychically, and that was what that was. Now, since then, the next time we went there, this last time, they had closed that entrance, and you have to go up in the thieves' entrance now, which is a very narrow passageway. Uh-huh. And I didn't. I was said we going up there again and try to say that name again. But when you know you had to give your tickets at the entrance of the pyramid, and uh, when I went in, the uh, the man's uh, taking the tickets said goodbye. So then I'm superstitious. So then I said, well, um, you tell nobody goodbye but me. Now I'm not. I went up halfway and I decided I'd come back down because I'm superstitious. Uh-huh. It was only, a bad omen. It huh? might. It might have been. He didn't know English too good, but the thing about it, he didn't tell nobody goodbye but me. So the band went up there, and I stayed in the first land, and I came on out. Boy, that, so anything you know, yeah, you have to. A lot of strange things happen to me. I go out there now, uh, around the pyramid. They call me the chief. A lot of people don't even know I got a band. They just saw me and they called me the chief. And I'd be around there with some of my friends, the camel drivers and the teenagers. I always like to sit back behind. Them. The Sphinx is strange feeling. Look at the Sphinx from that way, and I went to, to cogitate, and uh, it would end up where the sub teenagers, the teenagers, the secret police, all be sitting back there with me, on the sand, not saying anything. Hmm. Each was like that. They're like your friends. 
you don't have to say anything. You just surround each other. Because, uh-huh. I mean, if they don't like you, it might be a different story. If they like you, it's your friends. That's great. God, that's amazing. So you said raw eight times that first nine time. Nine times. Or nine times. Because I'm dealing with the equations, you see. And in, the, in this language, the um, raw is represented by the I, you see. And the ninth letter in this, in this alphabet is I. And the 18th letter is R, and that's equal to a 9, too, you see. And in fact, in the Arabic, because I'm the, 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 the name Ra is, stands for R, you know. Hmm. This is the letter R. Yeah. So then I'm dealing with equations. It, it takes equations. Equations uh, made this band, I mean, made this, um, the world like it is. Mm-hmm. Equations made it like this. Now you got to have another thing. Equations made the nuclear war here too. You have to have equations to do something about the situation here. Because we're not really in the um, shoes of man and woman, no way. We're all gods, you know. And that's what makes it dangerous because what we say and what we pass as a law becomes a reality. And people don't know that. And they say mean, hateful things about one another and be happening. Mm-hmm. So I don't say that. I'm saying about the great potential of everybody on this planet because I know it's there. Well, that's a very optimistic note to uh, to go into this next cut, which is from Egypt, Sun Ra and the orchestra, and uh, meets uh, Salah Ragab. Is he that plays his name? Drums with me when I go. Mm-hmm. He's he's an Egyptian general. He was. Oh, oh, he's a general? Yeah, he, he was, I said maybe he retired now, but he probably still is. Uh-huh. Well, let's listen to this uh, uh, cut from uh, a Praxis LP. It's entitled Dawn. This is KPFK Los Angeles, Pacifica Radio for all of Southern California, 90.7 FM. My name is Jay Green. The show is Straight No Chaser, and uh, my special guest tonight is Sun Ra, and uh, we've just been listening to Sun Ra and the orchestra meet Salah Ragab in Egypt, plus the Cairo Jazz Band, the Sun Ra Orchestra, uh, Salah Ragab on Kungas, John Gilmore on tenor saxophone, Marshall Allen on alto saxophone with Danny Thompson, Leroy Taylor on bass clarinet, James Jackson on bassoon, Tyrone Hill on trombone, Eric Walker on drums, Chris Henderson on the drums with Claude Broche accompanying him. And we heard Dawn on the uh, Praxis record label. This is from uh, Greece. Praxis has a uh, uh, a festival every year, don't they? And uh, I think you've been, because there's two volumes on Praxis of live yeah, concerts you've done there. We played one. Uh, yeah. American Embassy brought us there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and of course, Sun Ra was on keyboards, and uh, you heard that kind of eerie flute-sounding instrument. Uh, a synthachord was the uh, name of that instrument, which was uh, produced in Italy, as, as you said, in Rome. And uh, have never seen anybody play it. It was just an experiment. Oh, no. In, in, in Italy, they got a lot of electronic instruments in Kruma, and some way they don't advertise it, but... Uh uh-huh. We got some more instruments uh, called EVI that uh, is very beautiful. Can make the notes lower than the uh, low, the lower tone instruments. It can make higher notes like a flute. It covers a whole range of range of sound. Mm. Uh, and uh, but it's not in America. It's not for sale. And the one I got, well, they haven't put it out here either. I'm surprised. It has an incredible sound, and it's, it's you can't. It's a cross between a lot of different <laughs> instruments. Well, yeah, I can play two bone there too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oboe. It, it has a keyboard. Yes, yeah, a keyboard, and but I also blow it too. To, to I can make it uh, louder or softer by blowing in it, mm. so it makes it sound more like an acoustic instrument, you might say. Hmm. Because it's wind blowing, and that the. That takes away me the artificiality or something. That hmm. Sounds natural. Um, I remember reading once, or you mentioned to me that much of what uh, you consider your best music 
you've held back from commercial release. Is that, do you, I mean, is that true still, or are you starting to release things that you feel, and why would, you know, would you not release them? Well, see, this music from another dimension, and uh, it really would affect people, you know. In Chicago, I was accused of hypnotizing people and all kind of things, but it's not that, it's really, uh, you know, you, you have food for thought, and that's for your mind. But this is real soul music. It's not the kind you dance by, it's for your spirit. And your spirit will listen, you see? Which means, in a sense, the, all the earth parts of you will be blacked out, and your spirit will be listening to getting some soul food. And most people, they take the soul food as some, uh, you know, you eat, but that's for your body. This is soul food, it's music. The soul likes beauty. It it, it 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 likes things like that. You see a beautiful painting, that's for your soul, and a beautiful song, a hom- harmony, the soul listens. So this is, uh, I call it soul force music. Mm-hmm. Well, then you put it out there like that, like uh, a fellow in the band the other day, I was getting him singles, and he, he wasn't looking, so I asked him, well, well, why is it uh, you didn't come in? He said, well, he's listening to me play. His mind was, he was seeing spaceships, he had his eyes closed, he was seeing all kind of things. And uh, he, had to, he had to listen to that. He couldn't look at nothing, he had to listen. And so that was somebody in the band, you see, that couldn't really look at me, listening at that music. Now, I had to sort of cool down on it, and because I, now I'm gonna play the full force of uh, what I can do, you know, from a different dimension, because it, it, everything else been tried, um, in Chicago, a club owner told me one day, we was playing for a black club, Birdland, that one of the players said, you should be ashamed of yourself playing that music for these people. And I said, but you got your place packed. He said, yeah, but these are some black people, and it's Saturday night, they keep up a lot of noise, you can hear a pin drop. That's not like them. I said, well, they listening. They listening. And um, they were listening. Mm-hmm. They were listening all the time, you know. We'd be playing some place in Chicago. Some people would come in, and they'd, they'd go right back out. They'd buy some, but they'd go out, and they'd come back the next night, so I had to clean myself up to hear this music. So it is effective, and I know it is. And I know it will work for this whole planet, because it has to, because the one who sent me here owns the planet, and it's bankrupt. It doesn't produce anything but dead bodies. And, and this uh, being don't want that anymore. It's a bankrupt planet full of dead men's bones. I wouldn't have it they gave it to me. But you know, I got a job, a job to do. I just had to make up my mind with all my heart to change the planet. And you know, it's impossible. Well, mission doubly impossible is my job. Mm-hmm. I can't get around it, and people won't be able to get around me because they're gonna feel something, and it's for their benefit, for them to listen. And not to believe me, I'm not asking them to believe me because it doesn't make any difference whether they believe me or not. They're going to be changed. They have to change in order to survive. And even animals will, uh, you, you take a fi- fire in the forest, you see the animals running. That's where the bad part of human beings is going to run. When they put the fire out there, the spirit fire, they, that bad part is going to get in the wind because it can't stand it. It'll have to go. The bad part that's killing people have to go. Yeah. Now, that's totally impossible with all these diseases and all these things happening to people for one person to say, look, we got to get rid of all this. And not only say it, but set it in motion to happen. Nothing happens unless somebody set it in motion. Well, somebody set this bad stuff uh, uh, in motion. I think it was Moses. But I don't know. Um, it, it possibly is because, you know, went to Egypt and they, they named the camels different names. And there's one named Moses. And I told Danny, I said, don't ride on the camel Moses. I think some well, that Moses wasn't quite right. So naturally he went on and rode on the camel, named Moses, and the camel threw him off in the sand. Hmm. Well, I think that, uh, I think that uh, it's time to play Rod to the rescue. Yeah, that's nice. You know, uh, definitely time to go back into outer space again. Right. And uh, this is uh, an album also on L. Saturn. 
So let's listen to uh, Rod of the Rescue and uh, uh, go out with uh, the Cosmo Musical Scientist. I, I like that name for you, Sun Ra. Uh, spiritual Scientist, of course. Ra to the Rescue. Ra to the Rescue on El Saturn. And uh, Mr. Ra is my guest tonight. And um, we look forward to uh, hearing you two nights uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, where, where are you off to after this? You're, I know you travel. You see, it seems like you're constantly on the move. You're constantly th- going to another place. Well, actually, I'm supposed to be in France right now. Uh, the the minister of culture has offered me a symphony orchestra with dancers, with ballet dancers and, and singers. And uh, that's supposed to be presented in Paris at the Opera House uh, March the 13th. But since then, they've changed their mind and they want me to sign a contract to be there three years with the symphony orchestra. They say I won't be restricted to come back here when I want to, but you know, contracts are contracts. <laughs> you mean you, you mean you'd have to be based in France for three based years? In France with a symphony orchestra because they want me to write some new things. And you don't Fra- want to do France that. France wants. Uh, do you, do you want to do that? Well, I mean, it's a big challenge, and I can do it. So why not? I don't have that outlet in America, mm-hmm. so uh, it it'd probably take a long time to try to get people interested in. Uh, me writing a symphony, but I got a lot of them. But they, they uh, symphonies from other dimensions. You see, the symphony, uh, direct, I mean, uh, composer here had to bow to the system and write what they system wanted. Mm-hmm. But I haven't bowed to any systems. And therefore, what I would write would be pure. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be tampered with. Well, the French, uh, they don't know what I'm going to write, really. They just say, uh, whatever, for France. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, 50 million Frenchmen can't be wrong, they say. <laughs> France brought me that the first time, too, at yeah. the, at St. Paul de Vincent, where uh, Picasso, uh, so they, they recognize what I'm doing. I know they play you live or have played tapes of your performances right in the middle of the day in, in, then, in Paris. Then I'm going to be um, uh, down the Riviera, down in there, too, and that's intriguing. Down, nice and warm, down the down Riviera? In, down the, in mm-hmm. Nimes, down in... Uh huh. Southern France. Oh, that should be great. I'm sure that uh, a lot of the sunbathers will love. And then they will. Uh, they they actually wanted me to come by myself, but I insisted on at least 15 pieces in my band going, and they said that's all right. Hmm. And then they they want to hold up, but they they putting some people out of a villa or shot to where I can stay. That's you way. don't know where you're playing there because I imagine there's some beautiful palaces and, and beautiful venues. Or, I, well, I get, you wouldn't call them venues, of course, but beautiful places to to perform music. Well, the main thing is getting the seminars ready for Paris for this debut of my symphony. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. dancers and sing. Now I don't speak French too well, so that the thing about what am I going to have to sing or sing it? Yeah. The bigger the band, the better, huh? Oh, yeah, 62 pieces. I could do all kinds of things with that, you know. Yeah. I got but you, but you like playing with big orchestras. I like that because I have the talent to do it. And if I just, I could get a, every time I go to Europe, they want me to play in some opera houses by myself. In fact, I did that once. I, I played in, I couldn't resist Venice. I played in the opera house there. And, and I played in Florence. And I played in uh, Rome. And I played somewhere else by myself. Before, and, and somewhere in Belgium. By mm-hmm. the way, that's we Belgium was one on the list too. I didn't mention that. Belgium always gave me a, a big plate. Yeah. This time I stayed a week in Belgium, playing different places. Hmm. Um, I want to kind of switch things around a little bit here, and play something uh, with a quartet that you did uh, for Horo Records in Italy, and um, you. As mentioned, you like playing with big orchestras and lots of members, uh, lots of musicians. Um, what I I understand you're not as uh, you don't feel as comfortable performing with tr- quartets, do you? You don't like to perform with trios or quartets. Oh yeah, I like that, but then I have to take my talent to the ranger side. Anybody can play with a quartet. Not everybody can arrange for a band. Uh huh. Even if they can arrange, it doesn't reach the public. Yeah. My Ramos can reach the public. So why should I take a talent and put it aside just for the sake of money? 
Mm-hmm. Cause I'm a spiritual being, and money doesn't mean anything to me. On certain pl- other planes, it means nothing. You see, so therefore I have to deal with what I know is worthwhile. Let's bring them out here because I came out here. I was teaching at the University of California in Berkeley, and um, I was teaching the black man the cosmos. But something wrong with black people here. They don't support things that's better for them. So they, I had about five of them and about 50 white students, and it was black, the black men, the cosmos. I was talking about space, which, uh, which is where they're headed, whether they want to or not. They have to leave the sphere and go mm-hmm. somewhere else. You know, history repeats itself. The black people in America came from Africa, and they got to leave here. They can't go back there. They got to keep on moving. And they've been uh, indoctrinated to 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 overcome any kind of situation. Being what they have been in America and going through all that, meaning they bow now they ought to go to any planet and conquer because they had the roughness. They still got it. They're not part of the system. They never will be. They history repeats itself. They will go to pioneer in outer space because they've gone through so many hardships and that's what you need, someone who's totally detached from this planet. Mm-hmm. And they're the only people been totally detached from governments, from from uh, having an army or a navy or from owning anything. 400 years, work for nothing. Now, they can go and use some of this experience of uh, overcoming hardships on other planets. The whole thing is out there waiting for them mm-hmm. to go out there. And not many jobs here. It's just... Um, they don't fit here, you know. You have difficulty in schools with black children. They can't, they can't learn that way. They need another, another way to learn. And you know, I would say white people done all they can to help the situation. And there was editorial in the Philadelphia paper which said, "Well, we don't know what they want. Uh, uh, whatever they want, we can't give it to them." And Philadelphia stopped trying to help black people. They said, "We well, we can't give them what they want. We don't know what it is." And that was it. I see a lot more black people at your concerts. Oh, yeah, well, they come and they're going to have to. Uh, I was encouraged in San Francisco because we played the Opera House, that old Opera House, uh, the Bayview Opera House, it's from 1800 or something. And some teenagers, uh, they came out. Some people brought them out. And the next night, these people didn't pick them up. Well, they stayed some distance, so they rode their bicycles to the concert. They said they had to. So that's encouraging. Well, um, then when you're talking about things, you got to, you got to be able to teach teenagers, you know, and a different system has to be devised for black teenagers. Different system. I got the system of how they can learn what they have to get to use what their what their ancestors. That system will work. Very simple, uh, where they can understand languages because, uh, you know. All Americans, white and black, got to, to study these other languages because these people in other countries know English, and not too many black, no white people or black people know these different languages in Europe. You go over there, practically all of them know English. You go over there, you don't know Russian, you don't know French, you don't know nothing, you know? It's an ignorant country as far as language is concerned. If you don't know people's languages and don't understand their culture, you most certainly will have false impressions of them, and that's what America has to do. They got to know other nations because they really the rules of the world in certain aspects and uh, guns and shooting people don't make friends. Mm. That's for sure. Um, let's play some music uh, from this album, New Steps, on Horror Records. This is recorded in January of 1978. And um, we're going to be playing my favorite things that, uh, of course, John Coltrane really, I guess, uh, was the man in uh, jazz music, uh, Afro-American music, Afro-American classical music, whatever you want to call it, um, made famous. It was uh, something that reached out to a lot of people. Uh, you were, you met John Coltrane. You talked to him, didn't you? And, yeah, uh, well, I really um, put him on top to spiritual wisdom and... Um, that was the direction, you know. He's with Miles Davis when I met him. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I was really putting out some pamphlets and things to my friends on my research, and uh, it wasn't supposed to be given to everybody, but Pat Patrick was over there talking to him, 
They gave him some of this forbidden literature. That opens up a person's mind for getting anything they want in the world. I said then that maybe he wasn't mature enough to have that wisdom. Mm -hmm. Did he get on top and he'd be obliterated if he wasn't pure and hard? I told Pat, you shouldn't have done that. Well, I went and I talked, I met him then, and I talked to him. And uh, for the f first thing he's, and I played some music for him that not even anybody in this band heard, you know. It's not on record either. That's when he said he was gonna leave my eyes and he was gonna go on his own cause some things he wanted to play, but he'd been afraid to play it. But he said, I see the direction I ought to go. So then that's when he, he left. And he got that, um, and he was always trying to reach this what he heard like that. On that soprano, he was reaching to that. The whole thing changed. And uh, he's playing in New York, and I'd go there and talk to him. He'd come, some, he'd play at the Apollo Theater. He'd come and talk to me at the, uh, in between shows and all that. You know, but when he, when he got more and more famous, he didn't come around. That was a mistake. You know, he, did, he didn't develop beyond the money. Mm -hmm. The last time I saw him, he said, "Well, I don't have, I don't have any more ideas." I said, "That's dangerous." I said, "You know what? You should come rehearse with me and let the world know where you got that in the first place. It's imperative. Let them know where you got." It. But he he never made it. You know, it's too late. I would have loved to have heard him with the orchestra. That would have been something. Yeah, else. it would have been, but it was too late. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's listen to uh, My Favorite Things with uh, Sun Ra, John Gilmore, Michael Ray, Luckman Ali. This is KPFK Los Angeles, Pacifica Radio for all of Southern California, 90.7 FM. My name is Jay Green. show is Straight No Chaser. And uh, my guest tonight is uh, the man who is the head of the cosmos, Mr. Sun Ra. And we've just been listening to his quartet doing my favorite thing. Sun Ra on keyboards, John Gilmore on tenor saxophone and percussion, Michael Ray on trumpet and percussion, Lachman Ali on the drums. This is from a Horo recording from Italy, recorded in January of 1978. And um, we're going to be listening to... Uh, Something else that Sun Ra did, uh, one of his more recent releases from an album entitled Hiroshima, Light from the Dark Stars. Do you remember some of the band members of that that you could, because they're not listed on the album, that were, uh, that were part of that orchestra? You mean that, All Star? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> that, Don Cherry. That All Star band. Don Cherry, Archie Shep, Richard Davis, Lester Bowie, Don Murray, Philly Joe Jones, uh, Clifford Drivers, and John Gilmore, Marshall. That that's was, that's an all star that band. In, yeah, all star band. And their concerts were given in Berlin, Paris, and so in Italy too, uh, some city there. Uh -huh. It was really, um, well, the record to let you know what was happening, which yeah. is a total other dimension. The musicians get with me, they play differently in a way. So you the artist ship like you never heard him before on uh, soprano most. Mm -hmm. Really playing something else, another dimension. All right. Well, That's because he couldn't play his regular thing, you know, because I was playing some other kind of chords, so then he had to create. Uh -huh. It wasn't where you got your thing together and mentally, because then uh, I was playing uh, two and three keys, just saying, I mean, uh, in different keys, and then I was playing rhythms against rhythm one rhythm with one hand seven full time the other one four four for three four and I was constantly changing that means that a musician have to uh, really he, he got to really improvise another kind of got to create I put it like that because he can't play his regular thing uh -huh. that's great every um, time he I think he's going to play his regular thing I, I make a wrong call and then he got to it's disturbing <laughs> and I make the wrong call sound right and then they have to fill their way around to try to get back in. Yeah. They don't know the key I'm playing in. You see, that's it. You don't know nothing. I find out that people like you better when you don't know what you're doing because they don't know what they're doing. So when you don't know what you're doing, they feel comradeship with you. <laughs> if you know what you're doing and you're so versed, you know it, it makes them feel bad, but then they 
So you don't know what you're doing. You're feeling your way through, and, and and they have to do that every day in that day of their life. So then they can they seem to understand that better when you when you're just making it. You know, uh-huh. you look like you're not gonna make it, and then you do, and that's what they be waiting on. Because then that means in that day of their life where they don't know what they're doing, they're gonna make it too because they've heard it and they got the impression how to do it. The things can be going wrong. But you still convert. Well, you inspire around. Them. Yeah, you yeah. See? And you get the inspiration to to do things beyond what you can do. Right. You do the impossible. You got to challenge them. Right. And then you want having the bag men and bag women out there. They could do some things too, but they broke down because they couldn't handle the, the system. The system getting so it can't handle itself. In one sense, it needs some needs some help. You know, one of my my records, I'm saying that uh, that uh, that it's going to be some help from other sources for for leaders, because leaders are almost endangered species. That's true. Spiritual leaders, definitely. Well, I mean, I, I think that's probably one of the main reasons that the, we, we're, we're in the uh, problems that we've had and are going to have is that we just can't have a spiritual leader. They the, won't the elect only, one. The only difficulty is a good book which says, why be righteous over much? Why should you destroy yourself? So you can't be too righteous. If you're too righteous, it's forbidden. Mm-hmm. But a lot of spiritual leaders don't know that. See, that's really, I'm not saying I'm righteous because you take, as bad as this planet is to go out talking about rescuing people in their present condition, it, it really it'll be totally wrong because they don't deserve it. But the point of it is uh, sympathy and kindness and friendship and love overlooks those particular things. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's, um, we're going to, we're going to end the show with that all-star jazz um, cut that uh, Sun Ra was just talking about. And I was wondering if you would mind reading one of your uh, poems from, uh, the immeasurable equation to end the show tonight. Would you pick one out and? Uh... Well, you know these things are written like sometimes in phonetics. So then, if I if I read it, they might understand it because if I say way, I might be talking about W E I G H instead of W A Y. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the trouble. So, so they'll misunderstand Phonet- it. Phonetics got these people on this planet messed up because they think it means one thing. But this doesn't seem to be in too much of uh, that. So I read part of this, say, when reality reaches a certain point, beyond that point is myth. Even before the beginning of what is called, what is, is called, even before the beginning of what is called reality, myth is the being before. When all that is parable possibly lived and caused to be, the hope of continuation living being is myth. Myth from equational wisdom Ignorance is, is. The myth is the seemingly false and the seemingly impossible. The borders of the realm of myth are vast and non-existent because there is no limit to the imaginative realm idea of the myth. Here is a challenge, challenge, challenging frontier. Only the bold and wise ignorance should pioneer. The myth touches every field of endeavor so that the myth is the bridge to the greater myth. Out upon the plains of myth, strange non-realities dwell. Strange because they are not according to the propagated accepted law. The non-reality may sometimes be expressed by the word not. Sometimes that which has reached an end is considered as not. So that a problem is posed on a way out difficult at the same time. Consider the three O's. Mm-hmm. 